This is bullshit, Captain. I stormed, slamming the door to his office closed. She damn well saved my life, and now she's sitting in a holding cell. Take a seat, Carver. I, the fuck I will. Take a goddamn seat, John. He growled at me, sitting behind his desk. Just shut your mouth for five seconds. Maybe you could sort this clusterfuck out. Reluctantly, I sat down, but whatever he had to say better be good. I wasn't about to throw Donna under the bus, not when she had just saved my life. All right, tell me again what happened, he said, lighting up a cigar. I already told you twice, so tell me again. <sighs> Sighing, I recounted the whole thing. The captain sat back, listening carefully, after a couple of questions here and there. Okay, he said, when I had finished. Anyone take a statement from her yet? No, I replied. They just threw her in a cell, probably waiting for the vampire ministry to turn up. Well, as I haven't called them yet, that's not bound to happen. I laughed. You really think they're just going to sit back and wait to hear from you? They have eyes and ears everywhere. You know, John, I would call you paranoid, but you're probably right. It buys us a little time. Time for what? Time for you two to get your stories straight, he replied, blowing acrid smoke into the air. You said you were alone in that alleyway. Sure of that? Yeah, I'm sure of it. So nobody saw Donna lose her shit and feed on this guy, right? She didn't lose her shit, Captain. The guy just pumped out 30 rounds into her. She fed to stay alive, or at least to stay in the fight. I don't give a fuck about motives. I do care that nobody else apart from you saw her feeding, and it was only you, wasn't it? Yeah, I said, shifting uncomfortably. But the autopsy is going to show. He waved away. The autopsy will be inconclusive. At best, a man loses a lot of blood when he gets his arm torn off, Carver. Plus, from what you told me, she tore the guy's throat out, so no bite marks. If you and Donna stick to your story of self-defense, I think the whole thing will just melt away. Why are you doing this? I asked. He sighed and stumped out a cigar. Because I like Donna. And that piece of shit got everything he deserved. Besides, I don't, I don't want the new squad finished when it's only just getting started. The real question you should be asking is who are those two gun-toting assholes and why they tried to take you out? I was tempted to tell him about the contract the New York master had put on my head, but kept silent for now. If that happy asshole was behind all this, I intended to take him out on my own terms. Benson and Hodge's law, I'd be damned. Not sure, I shrugged. A man like me makes many enemies over the years. But you can bet I'm going to find out. He nodded. Okay, John. Better go see Donna and get your story straight before she makes a statement. Go on. Get the hell out of here. I stood up and headed for the door before turning back to him. Thanks, Captain. Don't strain yourself. Get out of my office. You stink it up the place. Smiling, I closed the door gently, and I headed for the holding cell. Donna's cell was at the end of the corridor. Unlike the others, it wasn't a barred cell, but enclosed in thick steel with a heavy metal door. The guys in the precinct had fondly named it Cell 666, but officially it was labeled as Vampire Class 1 Holding Cell. The on-duty officer unlocked the door and beat a retreat back to read the latest cover of Jugs that lay centerfold first across his desk. I was betting night shifts were a real drag for him. As I entered, Donna looked up and smiled weakly. Hello, John. Come to read me my rights? Listen up, Donna, and listen fast. You never fed on that guy. What are you talking about? You saw me do it. I didn't see you do shit but save my life and kill a guy in self-defense. And that's exactly what's going into yours. There was no one in the alleyway but us and two dead assholes and they ain't saying shit. You understand? But if anyone should ever find out... And what about the autopsy report? I spoke to the captain. It's all taken care of. Just follow my lead. Tell him what I'm going to tell him. Self-defense, nothing more. She stood and reached for me. Then I took a step back. There's blood on your hands, Donna. Indeed there is, another voice piped in from behind us. I turned to see a tall vampire stood in the doorway. He was dressed head to foot in an immaculate tailored suit. 
burgundy tie and all. His face was both feminine and terribly masculine, all at the same time. Please leave us, detective, he said arrogantly, not even bothering to look my way. And just who are you, I said, pissed at the casual demeanor. He turned to me then, looking down his thin nose at me. My name's Vlondo, Alex Vlondo. I'm an aide to the Vampire Ministry, and I'm here at their bequest. You are the infamous John Carver. Yes, I am, I replied stiffly. I'm also a senior detective in this precinct, and unless your name just happens to be Captain J. Azan, you ain't ordering me anywhere. He frowned, then looked at Donna, then back at me. I could call your captain and have you escorted from the room if you pleased me to do so. But you were directly responsible for the night's mess and putting one of our kind into disrepute. It's probably better if you stay. Besides, I may need to ask you some questions after I have spoken with the lovely Donna here. After all, it was us that placed her into your department. I let the whole my fault and disrepute thing lay for now. Sure you did. I smiled at him. And that would make her a police employee and... As she works in my department, I guess that would make me her superior in rank, if nothing else. So you see, you don't really have much of a say here, and I believe my captain would also agree. So thanks for your permission to stay, but I don't really need shit from you. He just stared at me, his face a blank mask. But whatever power resided in me that still connected me to the vamps, I could feel his energy starting to thrum. He was royally pissed at not getting his own way, but was just about managing to keep a lid on it for now. Suddenly he smiled. Very well, detective. But but you won't mind if I ask Donna here a few questions. I have that right, at the very least. I smiled back at him. Ask away, Vlondo. I made a show of looking at my watch. Be sunrise soon. I wouldn't draw things out if I were you. He ignored that and turned to Donna. Tell me everything that happened, Miss Shrewberry. Donna told him everything, omitting the part about her feeding on the perp. When she had finished, the tall vampire glared at her, his nostrils flaring in quick rhythm. You're lying to me, Mrs. Shrewsbury. I could smell your lies like a wretched stink all about you. Answer me! He suddenly screamed at her, Tell me everything! I felt his power lash out at her, and she sat up, becoming rigid, a small moan escaping her lips. Suddenly I was there, the hissing vampire backing off as I shoved a now glowing cross in front of his face. You dare to threaten me, he snarled. You're fucking right I do. You were trying to compel her to mind fuck her, and that is illegal, my friend. Only against humans. She is a vampire, he said, still backing up. I shrugged. Semantics. Besides, she works for the police department. Wrong. She works for us, Carver. Not anymore. You tell the vampire council, oops, sorry, the vampire ministry, she works for me now. You're claiming here, then. He spat, still backing up to the cell, his arms thrown up to fend off the cross's flaming glare. Sure, I said, suddenly tired of these games. Carver, Donna said from behind, don't. So she's yours, the vampire repeated, under your protection. That's right, fangboy, now take a walk. The vampire grinned at me ghoulishly. So be it. I shall inform the council of your proclamation. And just like that, he was gone. I felt Donna's hand on my shoulder as she spanned me around. Have you any idea what you've just done, John? How can anyone have been amongst our kind for so long and not know nothing of our ways? She was obviously pissed at me, but I wasn't really sure why. The hell did I do now? I said, stuffing the glowing cross back in my pocket. What have you done? She said, facing the room in long, angry strides. You've just told all of Empire Kind that I belong to you, that I am now under your protection. Do you have any idea what you've dragged yourself into? We're now seen 
by my kind as one and the same. Any vampire that tries to kill you will also come after me too, and vice versa. Now wait a goddamn minute here. You're saying that the vamps now see us as one entity, that my shit and your shit are the same thing? How eloquently you put things, John. But in essence, yes. I couldn't help but laugh. She looked at me, her eyes narrowing. I don't see what's so amusing. I laughed again. We're partners, Donna. That's all. Just partners. She smiled a little then. But there was sadness in her eyes. You don't get it, John. But you will. I guarantee that you will. It was close to dawn when I dropped her back at her house, and I was nearly falling asleep at the wheel. Come on, John, you're tired. I have many spare rooms. We can ride back to work together when night falls. I took a look at her home. It was a large and worrying-looking townhouse. A reproduction, no doubt. After all, the city itself was less than 30 years old. Still, it must have cost a fortune to recreate, and I wondered if one of Donna's former homes had looked something like this. As for being tired, she was right. I was physically and mentally exhausted, and so reluctantly accepted her offer. The interior of the house was very much reflected the outside. The furniture was all wooden antique, the floors covered with heavy, thick, soft carpeting. Crystal chandeliers hung from high ceilings, and darkly colored oil paintings festooned the walls. Please have a seat, John. She gestured toward the large, comfortable-looking leather sofa. I need to shower and change. I'll be right back. And off she went, disappearing deeper into the house. I lay back and looked around the room, my eyes settling on a certain picture above the old fireplace. Sweet Jesus, I mumbled, climbing to my feet and drawing closer. It was a picture of Donna. Not this Donna. A Donna from another time. She was dressed in a large hoop frock, her ample breasts straining against her tightly fitting corset. On her head was a large pink bonnet, her hair cascading down one marble smooth shoulder. Behind her was a nighttime lake, the moonlight reflecting on its still surface. The artist had caught a lock of smoldering beauty on her face that made my mouth feel a little dry. Do you like it, detective? I jumped, a little guilty. Sorry, I didn't mean to snoop. That's quite all right. She came into the room. She was dressed in pale shorts that showed off her long, toned legs and a baggy t-shirt. Thankfully, she was wearing a bra beneath. What year was this? I said, more of something to say than anything else. That was 1875, in Georgia. The man who painted it used to be a slave. He spent almost his entire life in the cotton fields. Can you imagine? Just such talent. Wasted. In such a foul way. He died only a few months after painting this picture. History's filled with all manner of foulness. I've been alive to see many things. I envy the mortal existence of such a short life. Don't worry, Donna. I've seen plenty of foulness in my short, mortal existence. She nodded thoughtfully before smiling, breaking the remorseful mood. Why don't you shower, John? And I'll make us something to eat before bed. You could use the bathroom on the second floor, attached to your bedroom. Second floor, on the left. The shower was hot and refreshing. Probably stayed in there longer than I should enjoying the steam and feeling some of the tension of the last night slip away. When I got out, there were fresh clothes folded neatly on my bed. A pair of blue jeans, a white shirt, fresh socks, even a pair of cotton undershorts. Shrugging, I put them on, putting my gun over the bedpost, but I slipped my cross back in under my shirt before I headed downstairs. The smell of cooking meat perfumed the room. In here, she called to me, and I followed the sound of her voice, which led into a kitchen diner which consisted of all the mod con in contrast to the living room. Thanks for the clothes. You're quite welcome. Please, John, take a seat, she said, putting a plate before me. 
The smell of steak made my stomach growl, and I tucked right in as she sat down on the opposite side of the table. She had a wine glass in her hand, and I tried hard not to look too closely at the contents. When I had finished eating, I sat back, feeling warm and content. It was a strange feeling to feel such a way in front of a vampire, but I felt it nevertheless. Smiling, she reached over to me and picked up my plate. Her silken hair brushed the side of my face, and I reached up to stroke it, relishing the feel of it underneath my fingertips. Donna froze in place, and I realized what I was doing, even though I'd never intentionally meant to do so. It was almost like an automatic reflex, and I quickly drew back my hand, suddenly embarrassed. But she caught it up. Her grip just on the underside of painful. She turned towards me, her eyes silvered, and raised my wrist to her face. And rubbed her cheek against it. I felt the merest brush of her velvet lips, and then she turned away, taking a deep, shuddering breath. Go to sleep, John. We're both tired. Go to sleep. I wanted to say something to her. Anything, but in the end, I said nothing, and I went to my room and locked the door. The minute my head hit the pillow, I was sound asleep. I dreamed of someone calling to me from across the moonlit lake. I was awoken by a pounding on my door. John! Donna called frantically. Open the door, John, can you hear me? Open the fucking door! Quickly, I climbed out of bed and unlocked the door. Donna barged past me and grabbed up my phone from the bedside table before throwing it at me. Jesus, John, do you sleep like a stone or what? Quickly, I checked the phone. Eight missed calls and two voicemails. The hell's going on, Donna? The vampire ministry has been attacked. The whole building has been blown to hell. The captain's been trying to get a hold of you for the last 20 minutes. Eventually, he rang me and asked if I knew where you were. And you told him here? Her eyes narrowed. Why? Do you feel you have something to be ashamed of, John? No, I said quickly. But you know how cops like to talk. Well, let them. You have more important matters to attend to. The captain wants you on site ASAP. Great. I said, throwing on my boots. You gonna get changed? I wouldn't go to the office dressed like that. Nobody would get a damn thing done. I won't be coming with you, John. The sun's still up. I checked my phone again. It was a little past 3 p.m. Shit. Okay. I'll see you at the office. Get hold of Hawking. He's already on scene. They're just waiting for you. All right. I said, rushing past her. Talk to you later. That said, I unlocked the front door. Donna stayed back from the glaring sunlight as I slammed the door and headed for the car. The Vampire District was in the business section of the city. Only a 20-minute ride for Donna's neighborhood. As I turned the corner onto Jointers Avenue, I could already see smoke billowing in the near distance. Less than 15 minutes later, I arrived on the scene. I had just stopped the engine when Jason Hawking came on the run. We have a real clusterfuck here, John he said, pointing at the smoldering building that was surrounding the fire engines and emergency vehicles. Looks like the firefighters have managed to get it pretty much under control. Yeah, he replied, following beside me as we approached. Fire guys responded in quick time, but the building's still in ruins. Yeah, I can see that, I said, looking at the black and smoldering shell. The fire chief reckons there's some kind of accelerant it was used. No way it could have spread and burnt so hot so fast. Oh. Most of the building here was made of brick, John. So we're thinking of sabotage. Hawking nodded. First, they thought some kind of explosion. Now they think, I mean, implosion? Maybe something set in the basement connecting the accelerant. Must have been an inside job then. No way someone connected could get anything like this past the vamps. Hawking shrugged. Maybe. Guess we'll know more when they sift through the wreckage. You! You there! A weasel-faced man called out from behind the yellow police tape. An annoyed-looking, plain-clothed officer pushed past him. Detective Carver, the man screeched. Must have a word with you. I work for the Ministry. My master and many others are still alive inside. Let him through. The cop angrily lifted the tape and the little man scurried towards us, wringing his hands. Thank God, he said in clipped British tones. It was a room in the basement. 
he bobbled. The ministers were all secured there for their daytime rest. I tried to speak to the fire chief, but he simply won't listen. He says the building is too unstable to send in men, and he won't risk their lives for a few vampires, no matter how important they are. And how do you know your master is still alive? Hawking frowned. Because he is still alive. You're his human servant, I assume? I asked. Yes, of course. If my master was dead, I'd be followed him into the grave. Flames have already been extinguished, Jason countered. If your master still lives, all he has to do is wait till nightfall to work his way out. You damn fool, the little man growled, approaching Hawking, his hand opening and closing rhythmically. My master's injured and in terrible pain. I can feel it stabbing at me all over, and if that floor collapses and the daylight floods in, he's finished. I managed to slide myself between them. Who's your master? The man took a deep, shuddering sigh. My master is Judah of Bethel. He's a second minister and answers only to Nicholas Raddock himself. Thankfully, Nicholas was away on foreign business, although nobody's heard from him in some time when this terrible incident happened. Of that, we can be grateful, at least. But my master must be saved at all costs. Okay. We'll see what we can do, Mr. Um, Halesworth. The man held out his hand. I didn't bother to take it. Okay, Mr. Halesworth, you take a seat in the back of my car while we try to figure this thing out, okay? The little man, thankfully, did not argue, but climbed in the car, slammed the door closed behind him. You ain't thinking of going in there, John. Come on, let's go see the chief, I said, heading towards the milling firefighters. The chief and his crew were all gathered around the emergency vehicles, all but a few men still managing the hoses, which were raised above the building, sending down a kind of thunderous rain on the smoldering ruins, probably to keep any more fires from breaking out. The chief looked tired and pissed as we approached, flashing our badges. Jesus. He rolled his eyes, standing up from where he had been leaning against a large fire truck, black smudges of soot in his face. Can you give a fella a minute before you come with your damn questions? Afraid not, Chief. Just been told there's some more people inside that need a rescue. People? Oh, you mean the vamps? He snorted. If you think I'm sending my men in there for a few vamps, you're out of your goddamn mind. That's gonna look real good on your report, Chief. Hawking interjected. Left to burn because people inside had fangs. Well, listen here, wise ass. The chief said, getting right in Jason's face. First of all, the fire is out. Second, the ground floor is unstable. We need jacks and cutters, and they're already on their way. Until they arrive, I ain't sending my men in there. Besides, you ever seen a seriously hurt vampire dickhead? They go crazy, like wild animals or something. Okay, I get it, chief. I said, trying to draw his attention back to me before the whole thing escalated. That last dickhead comment had started a slow flush that was beginning to crawl up the side of Hawking's neck. Last thing I needed was my partner and the fire chief rolling around on the floor, trying to beat the shit out of each other. I have plenty of experience with the vamps. Sure you do, Chief said, finally turning to face me. I seen you on the news back in the day, John Carver. I was surprised you decided to come back to work here in a city full of vamps. I nodded. Didn't get much of a choice. That makes two of us, then, he replied, seeming to relax a little. Oh, look, man, he said, turning to Jason. It's been a hell of a morning, okay? No worries, Chief. We're here to help us all. That's right, Chief, I said. And you're right about the vamps. If they're badly injured in there, they may turn temporarily feral, and that makes them dangerous. Usually in this situation, someone from the vampire ministry would be in attendance. Usually a powerful master who could subdue any feral vamp. But, I said, turning to the burnt-out shell, here we are. Feels to me like you have a suggestion, Chief replied, his eyes searching my face. I want to go in, Chief, check on the situation. If those vamps emerge, when the sun goes down, it'll be a bloodbath. If they're badly injured and feral, they'll need to be put down. If they're still alive, they'll be in grave danger from the others. Since when does a butcher of Brooklyn care about saving vamps? I care about keeping a potential witness alive, Chief. It may be finding out what happened in here which means I have to get into the basement as soon as possible, like right now. No chance, Carver. You wait like everyone else for the safety gear and the cutters to arrive, then you can go in and secure the area for my men. And you arguing with him would get me nowhere. So, I just sighed. Okay, Chief, it's your scene. Now wait in the car. Come get us when you're ready to go in. 
His eyes narrowed. Don't do anything stupid, Carver. You go in there, I won't be sending anyone in to get you out. I held up my hands. Just gonna wait in the car, Chief. I called over my shoulder as we headed back the way we came in. So how are we gonna handle this? Jason said, matching my stride. We need to talk to our friend, I said, nodding towards the car. If anyone can get us inside, it'll be him. We could always wait for the rest of the rescue squad, you know. We could, but we ain't. We're going in. Every second could be a second too long. I want to know what happened in there. Get out, Mr. Halesworth. I need your help. The little man scurried out of the car, still wringing his hands. Okay, where is it? Where's what? He replied. Cut the shit out, bolt hole. Every vampire has one, a secret way out, in case shit hits the fan. The little man shifted uncomfortably. Oh, we're not supposed to talk about that. If you want to save your master's life, you'll show me. His time could be running out. That broke him. Uh, okay, okay, I'll show you. It's a little way around the back of the building behind a low hill. The entrance is hidden. I, I could take you there. Okay, wait a second. Jason with me. Quickly, we went around the back of the car. I popped the trunk. Holy shit, Carver. Jason gasped. Plan on going to war or what? Here. I shoved an MP5 in his hands. Put that under your jacket. I also handed him a couple of extra mags, silver loaded. As for myself, I took a sawn off shotgun and a large handful of shells, loaded with garlic soaked silver buckshot. It made a notable bulge under my coat. I'd reckon it wouldn't draw much attention from a distance. Okay, I said, turning to Halesworth. Lead the way slowly, don't look around. Speak only to me, you got it? Let's go. Walking at a normal pace, we made our way around the back, Jason and I making a great show of pointing at the building. Jason even pulled out a notebook as I made some observations. It was all a ruse, of course, with a couple of detectives doing their jobs. When we were out of sight, we broke into a quick trot, Hillsworth leading the way, until we climbed over a small hill into a wooded area. There, Halesworth led us to a hidden door. He flipped open a camouflage panel and punched in a code before pushing the heavy metal door open. Lights are out, he muttered. Master, he yelled. Master, it's I, your most humble servant. Shut the fuck up, I hissed at him, roughly shoving my hand across his mouth and pushing him to one side. Go back to the car and lock yourself in. Talk to no one, answer no questions. Understand? For a moment, I thought that he would resist, but in the end, his shoulders sagged and he nodded before turning away and heading back, hopefully towards the car. So, what now? Jason asked as I stripped off my coat, loosening my gun strap. I could hear a slight shake in his voice. Now we go in. I'll take the lead, you bring up the rear. Taking a deep breath, we stepped inside, the weak sunlight lighting up the concrete hallway. The air smelled of smoke and burning flesh. We were halfway down the corridor when he came across the first body. It was a vamp, lying face down, but it wasn't the fire that had seen the cause of death, but a gaping hole in the creature's neck. The spine had been severed, ribs torn open, the heart missing and torn free. Sweet Jesus, Hawking gasped. It was like it was trying to escape the fire, and then... There he trailed off. Yeah... Then something took it down. I finished for him. I think it may already be too late on this one, buddy. Got your cross with you? I said, taking my own from under my shirt. Always, he said, removing his own and hanging it in plain sight. Okay, we move in silently. Don't fire unless I do, you got me? Sure, I got it. Okay, let's go. We moved on until we came to another doorway. Not unlike the one outside... The metal had been twisted and torn either by the explosion of the vamps trying to escape. The room beyond was already starting to fill from the water raining down from above. Weak sunlight stabbed at the darkness through the burned and ragged holes in the blackened ceiling. I stepped down a single step and gasped as I sank into the cold water that hit me just above the knees. This is fucked up, Carver, Hawking whispered as he entered the water, his flashlight cutting through the gloom. I said nothing but made my way into the corridor, 
dodging past a still smoldering beam. Something bobbed against my leg and I cried out, backpedaling as two bodies rose to the surface, locked in a deadly embrace. The burnt vampire's fangs still buried in the dead man's neck. His face seemed to be frozen in some kind of resolute sadness. The hell happened here? Hawking asked, peering over my shoulder. Fed on his own human servant, he'd be my guess. Just desperate to survive. He killed him anyway. But why? Why would he do that? You're not getting it, Jason, I said, never taking my eyes off the darkened corridor. When a vampire gets hurt that badly, it loses its mind. It comes nothing more than a rabid animal. Its body or whatever evil resides inside it demands blood. I'd do anything to get it. There's no reasoning with them, no recognition of the ones they love. They just kill Jason. Become nothing but mindless automatons, merciless, unthinking killers. Now keep your head in the goddamn game, watch my back. I could hear something. Now a low, rhythmic, booming noise, and a kind of hissing and snarling that set my teeth on edge and made the skin on my back feel tight and uncomfortable. As we hit the second corridor, it grew louder, and I knew that whatever was making that noise was just ahead of us. Get ready, Hawking. I said as we came to a blind corner. With a death grip on my shoddy, I flew around the corner, Jason by my side. The creature was female. Although most of its once blonde hair had been burned away, its skin black, cracked, blistered, and bleeding. It howled and banged its fist upon a metal door, leaving great bloody dents as its skin peeled away. Sensing us there, it turned and snarled at us, its face feral and covered with great weeping blisters. Its crimson eyes were filled with madness and hate. With an ear-splitting scream, it surged towards us, but Jason was already down on one knee, his weapon roaring in his hand, peppering the thing with blessed silver. The thing danced and jittered, flying backwards before splattering down and vanishing below the surface. Something wrapped around my ankle and dragged me under. I could see nothing, but my cross suddenly flared into light. And as the thing's chomping face made contact, it reared back, and I managed to kick free, my head breaking the surface. I heard Hawking's gun roar again, then he was screaming as I managed to get back to my feet. Jason was on his knees, the vampire latched onto his forearm, tearing at him, shaking him back and forth. I heard the cracking and breaking of bone, and Jason hollering, Get it off me, Carver! For fuck's sake, get it off me! Quick, I raised the shotgun butt. They were too close together. At this range, I'd blow Jason's head off, too. Casting it away, I drew my sidearm, remembering the ultraviolet light. I switched it on, and falling on my knees beside them, I thrust it into the crazed vampire's face, blinding its eyes that ran from its head like boiling egg yolks. Howling in pain and weakened by the silver, it thrust Jason away and staggered blindly down the corridor. Kill it, Carver, he shouted. Put the fucker down! It did my heart good to hear he was still in the fight as I took steady aim and emptied my entire clip into the bottom of the creature's spine, dropping it to its knees. Quickly, I fumbled around in the filthy water until my hands closed over the barrel of the shotgun. With a cry of triumph, I dragged it free of the churning waters and stumbled over to the now fallen creature. Without hesitation, I put both barrels against the creature's head and pulled the trigger. There was an explosion of blood, bone, and gore as the creature's head disintegrated covering me in its vile blood as it disappeared below the water. Just then, the door the creature had been pounding upon was flung open, and a bunch of pale faces with glowing eyes stared out at us. Is she gone? Have you destroyed her? Yeah. Yeah, she's finished. Thank you for your help, another man stepped forward from the back of the room. His arm was torn in a bloody mess and the side of his face badly burned. Judah of... I'm Judah of Bethel. I thank you for the service to us, John Carver. Poor Jeanette. He shook his head sadly. He just destroyed one of the Vampire Ministry's most illustrious members. A close friend of mine. Still, I thank you for giving her some sort of peace. Just then, one of the other men suddenly surged forward, but Bethel grabbed his arm and flung him back into the room. Your partner is bleeding, Mr. Carver. Let's take him out of here. They have many more injured inside, and their self-control is not as great as our own. Fine, I growled. If the place is clear, the fire service will be with you soon. Can I tell them it's safe to do so? 
I can control the others. We are quite capable of making our own way out as soon as the sun sets. Still, we appreciate your assistance, detectives. Ferals can be dangerous creatures, and you're not so easily dispatched. Yeah, no shit, Jason said, coming to stand beside me. Even Bethel, with his so-called precious self-control, still looked hungrily at Jason's bleeding arm. Come on, Jason, we're getting out of here. You'll be expected down at the station at your earliest possible convenience, I called over my shoulder, to make a statement. But I was already talking to a closed door. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video if you're watching on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening to tonight's podcast if you're listening on Spotify. And thank you guys for doing that thing where you subscribe, where you hit the bell, where you hit like, or you leave a little comment at the bottom or wherever you can leave comments at. I don't know. I don't use Spotify that much. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. This past year has been rough. I've been gone for quite a while trying to get things um organized for my own life and patreon subscribers you guys who subscribe everywhere th this this has kept me afloat in turbulent waters so i want to give a very special thank you to jordan humble diana kraus disciple strategy wolf emoji sully man brandon mendoza brimstone pandemonium kaltuna william wellington scruffy the janitor brenna crow lakeda canizales smiley the psychotic jenna Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough.